Now, as a new administration prepares to take over here in Nigeria, Nigerians are confronted with the stark reality of their country's broken health care system. No one can deny that Nigeria's health care infrastructure is one of the worst in the world, and for decades no government has paid much attention to it, in spite of the fact that virtually every day there are coruscating warnings from the World Health Organization and from local health officials that after years of corruption and neglect, this country is in a health care crisis and cannot afford to continue with business as usual. So, as the president-elect Bola Tinubu prepares to receive the keys to Aso Rock on May the 29th on a promise to transform Nigeria. What sort of support to the healthcare sector is he expected to give in a country that desperately needs to strengthen things like primary healthcare facilities, intensive care units, laboratory capacity, and emergency medical systems? Well, my next guest, Dr. Stella Iwagu, is the executive director of the Center for the Right to Health. She's also a nurse, midwife, public health specialist, and passionate human rights activist. And she joins me now in the studio. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Good to see you again. Thank you, Charles. And you've been speaking publicly about um, health care and its degenerative state in Nigeria. How much of a priority should the improvement of health care be for the incoming administration? It should be number one priority. Because every other thing you want to do is predicated on your health. If your citizens are not healthy, they can't get good education, they cannot work, they can't even secure your country. If your mm. armed forces are not healthy, they cannot secure your country. So health is the fundamental um, need mm. that uh, predicates other needs. If, of course, agriculture is important, but if your farmers are not healthy, they are not going to be able to produce good food. If your teachers are not healthy, who are they going to teach? And of course, you work in you know? agriculture and as of well. Of course, because yeah. eventually, hopefully, the discussion will look at the intersections mm. of these needs. Because one, in that, that's when we look at that all human rights are interconnected and interdependent. You fail in one aspect, it's going to affect the other aspect. So it's important that any, any policy or implementation of policy must adopt a multi-sectoral approach mm. with the health in all policies. So every policy you enact has a health implication and it's important you explore that health implication and how to ensure that you're not causing more harm than good. Mm. That's a very interesting point. Um, and we've seen healthcare given some prominence in uh, Mr. Tinubu's manifesto. But obviously, manifesto is a campaign document, mm -hmm. although that's something we would use to hold them to, the to account, mm -hmm. right? But do you believe that healthcare will get the attention it needs when he actually takes over, given the fact that it's the same <coughs> party and it's kind of transiting from one leader to another? Well, it's been a consistent pattern. Hmm. They've never delivered what they had promised. I've been in healthcare advocacy since 1999. And in those years, I was one of the people that worked very hard. As a matter of fact, I was awake for 72 hours straight mm. during the Abuja declaration when the head of states met in Abuja. And they agreed that they would dedicate 15% of the national budget to health care. Mm. And this is over almost 25 years to the day. That has never happened. We've never gone beyond 7%. Yes, there was an increase from the 2000 2022 budget and 2023, but it's very minimal hmm. because whatever increase that had been made had been swallowed by inflation and the devaluing of our currency. So it's almost actually when you do the proper analysis, we're spending less, not more. Hmm. You understand? When you look at the actual value of what the Naira could buy at that time compared to now, so as long as we're not making the appropriate investment in healthcare, as long as we are not maximizing whatever is allocated, because a lot of things we are located are frittered away through corruption, through neglect, and then sometimes poor release of funding for critical things that need to be done mm. at the time, at the time, and in a timely manner, negates the plans.
So we need to really move from documents and plans. We are great at writing great documents and great manifestos, but how do we breathe life into it? How do we make sure that it is people-centered? How do we carry the people along? This should be the people's health care. Mm. And this is not just what government should do alone. Government must engage people at every sector. And one of the things, one of the sectors that really is critical is the, the primary health care system is arranged according to the electoral ward system. So every electoral ward has a primary health care system. So it is the base of the pyramid. Mm. So and that is really about primary health care. And primary health care is not really just because a lot of our health care system is focused mainly in the institutions, in the hospitals, in the health care centers. By the time you start talking about health care centers, you're already dead, really. But if we can also, as we are looking at the infrastructure within the healthcare system, mm. we really need to get serious about the community health approach. We can, when you're looking at primary health care, people focus on the health center and people coming to you. Health professionals and the health system need to go to the people because the people is the base. If mm. people are healthier, and we got, we're going to look at those determinants, what determines health. When people are eating well, when their environment are sanitary, when they are not unduly stressed, because all those, these things break down their immune system, and it's because of all the stresses, the poor nutrition, the poor environment, all these contribute to chronic conditions, mm. and you have more people thronging into the health system, you know, the healthcare system, that is poorly equipped to take care of this so if we do not and there is no way this nation can cope in terms of actual health care services to these millions of population that are very ill so if we want to reduce our health care spending in terms of infrastructure in the, in the secondary and tertiary institutions we need to spend a lot of time money and resources in the primary health care setting right and it's primary health care is not just about the house hospital it's not about the structure in there. Yeah, that structure is important, but the structure should not wait for the people to come to them. The structure should go to the people. The structure should be accountable to the people. And the people must participate in the governance of those structures so that they will see that this is our health system. They will have a sense of ownership. People need education on what to eat. People need education on how to grow what to eat. We need to get back to the homestead gardening where every family is able to grow the basic mm. things they need to eat so that they can maintain their basic health. Right. I'm going to come to that um, hopefully a little bit later because I, I know you run the, uh, you're the CEO of Sustainable Demonstration Farms yes. um, and that you combine that with your healthcare yeah, and, work. And, and it's because of what I've seen in the healthcare system. Sure. So it's like you, we are here. When I was working in the hospital system, it's like somebody is uphill. And we are downhill and they're throwing babies downhill and mm. we're just catching the babies and burying them because right. they're already too sick and they die. Right. So we need to begin to look at how do we move. So uphill. nutrition, obviously, yeah, important. So but I, I'm going to come to that in a minute. But okay. I, I want to I want you to set out for us, because to some extent you have you talked about primary health care and the importance of it. But just set out for us the state of health care in Nigeria today. Ooh. What are the some of the issues that really give you cause for concern? Maternal mortality, right. infant mortality, the malnutrition level, the state of the environment, the lack of human the, well, health care man force, human infrastructure. Most of our pro professionals have left the country in droves because the infrastructure is not there. The remuneration does, can, the take home cannot take them home. And they see their patient die every day. It's very depressing and the burnout rate is very high. Mm. You know, because you know what to do. Remember when I had my accident? For five days, I was at the National Hospital, and we had professors that came to attend to me. And at the end of the day, they couldn't do anything. They told me, we know what to do, but we don't have the equipment. We don't have the infrastructure to do anything. That must be so and frustrating. And I had to be, oh, so I just thought I was going to die. And the same thing they couldn't do for me at the National Hospital. Surgeons were waiting for me at the tarmac in Ghana to do the surgery. And the moment I got into that, if I had gotten into Ghana on time, that surgery would have been done same day. But no, it was done the next day. And five days later, I was getting sensations that nobody thought was possible. And this is what happens. If Ghana can do it, Absolutely. why can't we? A lot of Nigerian students, medical students, are going to study in Ghana. What is it that they have that we don't have? So it is the leadership. 
it is the political will to make the necessary investment. And what is so sad about this is that our political leaders are number one health tourists. You would think there should be some level of conscience that's okay. Absolutely. Let's invest a, a dime of what we are do, using in health tourism into our own system. We have 36 states. And those, each of those 36 states could be 36 centers of excellence in tertiary institution, trauma care, kidney care, heart transplant. I mean, you see Nigerian doctors go abroad and they do marvelous things. And those that are even here, despite the challenges, are doing amazing things. All they need is the political will, the infrastructure. All the money we are spending in extra codes, we're spending in so many vehicles. In, 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 in. If we begin to cut away a lot of the waste in governance, Look at what legislators are earning compared to the professionals. If we begin to reduce the cost of governance in that level, then this could actually go into the infrastructure. We are a rich country. If we reduce the petroleum theft and the crude oil theft and all the things that are frittering away in our country, we can have first-class health services. Nigeria used to be the one place where people come for excellent health services. And then that is not the case anymore. Mm. We are going into places like India to get but class care. And most people, after spending all that million, they come home to die. Why is that? And we've seen alarming statistics about the number of people in Nigeria who are now dying from things like cancer, in addition to dying from things like malaria. Um, what sort of challenge does that represent, this increase from the burden of infectious diseases such as malaria to non-communicable diseases such as cancer to the health system in Nigeria? It's, a, it's overburdening. And this is happening because we did not take care of the base. Mm. When you do not take care of preventive services, when you do not take care of educational services that equip people with the skills, like when I talk to people about antioxidants and the impact of oxidative stress and free radicals in our system and how they destroy ourselves and how the solution is pretty basic and it's really basic, invite, reduce your, your exposure to environmental pollution and then eat the food that protects your cell. Mm. And if people are not doing that, then what is going to happen? We're going to have an overburdening on this end. And you see, in terms of connection of the system, a lot of chemicals were exposed to a lot of chemicals. The food we're eating is laden with chemicals, mm. fertilizers, pesticides that, that even the people that brought it to us don't, do not want. In our environment, it's generators and fumes all over the place. The vehicles, we don't have serious emission tests. See, there are things in the environment that impact our health. So we cannot just look at health from the hospital end. So it's going to be a holistic approach. It has approach. to be a holistic. We have yeah. to see how they're all impacted. You know, so people need to be able to have basic health literacy. It's not mm. just about the medications. That what are the things you can do or not do? What can you eat or not eat? What can, how do you sleep? All of these have implications to mm. your health. When people eat well... And that requires education. That requires it? education. We, which basic should be education. part of like the, we even start from the, the curriculum, the from, the from the curriculum in the educational system, right. from workplace education, from community education, so that people know mm. how to take agency for their health. We don't want to wait until we are ill and then we start looking mm. for the government. Government needs to start in making a priority. If you want to reduce health costs up there, then you need to begin to invest down here in empowering people to take agency for their health. Right. So, in other words, these many deaths that we have can be avoided with improved health care services, this holistic sort holistic. of approach that you're yes. talking about. Uh, uh, but, but so far, it does not appear, as you yourself mentioned, to have been a priority for Nigerian politicians. Do you think there is the opportunity now for a, a new government to really do something to improve the situation? Yes, it is a big opportunity. And there are also things, because a lot of our attention mm. has been focused in that um, allopathic healthcare structure where we're all looking at the Western model. We need to also expand our primary healthcare and even our secondary and tertiary healthcare to be integrated. We need to look at traditional medicines. We need to look at food. In America, there were, doctors are prescribing foods and vegetables as part of the therapy that people have to take. Mm. And we need to begin to look at that culinary medicine, look at acupuncture, look at things we can get from other cultures, things we have in our culture. A lot of our traditional medical practitioners have been belittled and their knowledge and skills have they taken them to their graves mm. and we have lost so much. 
countries with large population like China and India has multiple model systems of, of care that, that, that people are going there to benefit. Why are we not developing that? And the good thing right now that there's a bill in the National Assembly that is looking at setting up the council the, of traditional and uh, complementary and alternative medicine so that we can have multiple systems of care. If this doesn't work, this will work, or mm. a combination of this and this could work. And that opens up the field. And then even the educational system, the bill has been passed already supporting the College of Tradition, um, Traditional Complementary and Alternative Medicine. And it's important that the provost and the institutions are really set up so that more of our students are not just studying one method of medicine, mm. so that we have a structured yeah. system of medicine that incorporates our values, our herbs, our food, our spirituality as an important part of health care. That's, that's a, that's that is very excellent, holistic. Excellent analysis. And... Um, on the back of that, tell us about your NGO, the Center for the Right to Health, of which you're the executive director, and also about your sustainable demonstration farms, because the two, as you said, mm -hmm. are interlinked, aren't mm -hmm. they? Yeah, well, for over, since 1995, at mm. the advent of the HIV AIDS epidemic, when people with HIV were discriminated against, particularly in the health system, I said, no, that cannot be. They, ha they are human beings, and they have a right to health, like every one of us. And my theory of change that if we could get health professionals to respect the human rights of people living with HIV, mm. they could extend that courtesy to all of us, as the law demands, as humanity demands. But there are things within the system, and over the years I've been fighting, taking health systems to courts, fighting and empowering patients about their rights, but you can know your rights all you want. If the doctors and health professionals are overwhelmed because there are so few of them, and they don't have what they need to work, they're not going to cause any miracle. But what your, your NGO does is to educate is to people educate. about their rights. We educate their people about health. their rights. Right. We educate health professionals about their roles and responsibility right. in respecting those rights. Mm. We educate the judiciary about their roles and responsibility in securing and protecting those rights. We educate government policies, traditional rulers, in being, having everybody understanding their role in ensuring that patients' rights are respected. Mm. A lot of our activities led, contributed to the, to the passage of the National Health Act. And that National Health Act demand that 1% of our total budget, our national al budgetary allocation, should be dedicated to health care, particularly at the primary level. While things have been done, and that has started, there is actually a reduction instead of an increase, mm -hmm. even when needs have increased. So we're grateful for that, but more needs to be done. And this is the work that we're doing. We're part of the group that is pushing for the uh, National Health Insurance Scheme. Let's make it mandatory. Let's fund it. Let's educate people about it. The money you're using for your long hair or the money you guys use to buy people some T-shirts that they're not even going to use, all the politicians are throwing money around. Why don't you pay for the National Health Insurance um, cost for a whole community? You are well to do. Why don't you pay people's premium? That is one way you ensure that they get health care. So we need to find creative way of ensuring that people prioritize their health. Mm. Our people, apart from the government, our people are not prioritizing their health. They will buy expensive clothes, but they will not eat healthy food, and they will not prioritize preventive measures right. or even take early symptoms seriously. So there is responsibility to pass around. At well, I mean, stage. in fairness to, to the Nigerians, although that's not an excuse, mm -hmm. I mean, everybody everywhere, that there's a culture of fast food eating because a lot of people have to be at work. They've got to dash out, buy, you know, whatever it is. They buy burgers and things in order to just kind of fill... Their, their stomachs quickly. But, I mean, you, you've said a lot of things and a lot of things that make a lot of sense. But if you could put them in kind of bite-sized chunks, um, like into short, medium, and long term, um, beyond, obviously, health being put on the front burner, what would you like to see happen to really fundamentally improve healthcare in Nigeria in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term? In the short term, the working condition of healthcare, the remaining healthcare professionals need to be prioritized. Mm. The infrastructure in the healthcare system, how can you not have oxygen? We have a doctor die in her own department because there was no oxygen. What would it take to produce oxygen and ensure that we have access to oxygen? Do we really have to import all our basic medications? What would it take to set up factories so that medications can be produced here according to international right. but those standards? those would be long term or yeah. medium term? Medium term. Like setting because, up the factories. Yeah, setting up a factory. Right. It can be done short term, really. Because without access to essential medicines, 
you're not really going to get it right. Mm. So infrastructure within the health system and then ensuring that uh, the, that's what we call tax shifting. Because now that we don't have as much professional doctors and nurses as we used to, we might need to train and empower other cadres of care that can provide the gap, that can fill the gap that has been created. And of course, we're talking about complementary and alternative medicine. Mm. We can look at other models so that people have options. Because as it is right now, not everybody can afford the tertiary or even the primary allopathic uh, system of, uh, of care. So we need to bring in traditional healers, we need to bring in traditional better tenders mm. and equip them. That way they, they are in the system, they are registered, we know them, and we assess the knowledge gap so that we can fill it. Right. I remember during the early days of my study, there is this book where there is no doctor. You know, before Western medicine came, we were surviving. Mm. So how do we improve? prove the skills of this lower level of right. care we, and see how we can ensure that what they're doing right. is um, we, we, We've got less than a minute. The, the one thing that unites all of this is that the government really must increase their budgetary allocation exactly. to healthcare. Exactly. Budgetary allocation and then monitoring of that allocation so that it is mm. not frittered away. Because if you increase the allocation, then it's more money for people yeah. to steal and, and, and that and, needs to And start. probably also show some creativity and uh, resourcefulness in seeking additional and alternative sources funding, of funding. Funding, and that is where the private-public partnership mm. comes in. And there is really opportunity for entrepreneurs within the healthcare sector, and that can be filled, especially if we also look at, even looking at um, communication, mm. ITC. For example, my surgery was done by an expert who was in New York guiding doctors that were in Ghana. Mm. That's telemedicine. So with a lot of our brains gone, we can still pull them in using um, the internet and, yeah. and artificial intelligence and all the things that technology can do for us today is something that we can leverage in the short term. I have to say it's been an absolute delight talking with you. And uh, you. I do hope that the people who are in government or expecting to be who are coming in are listening to you. Thank you very much indeed. Dr. Stella Iwagu is the executive director of the Center for the Right to Health. She's also a nurse, midwife, public health specialist and human rights activist. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Charles. That's it for this edition of Arise Prime Time. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.